and we have Peter Heller in the house. He is the <laughs> You're not supposed to clap till the end. <laughs> How are you going to hold up the sign? I, I've warmed him up before. He's going to be talking. He's a, the New York Times bestselling author of titles like The Dog Stars, Celine, The River, and others. He's a fellow Denverite and Colorado, and he's going to talk about his brand new title, The Guy. Readers of The River may recognize Jack, a young man whose whole world was turned upside down in a violent turn of events. Now escaping his own grief, he takes a job in an elite fishing lodge in Colorado. In many of Peter's novels, nature poses the danger. In The Guide, the world outside the lodge is dealing with the spread of a novel virus. But the real evil comes from people who use the wilderness's wide open spaces to commit and hide crimes. I had so much fun reading the reviews of The Guide. Kirkus notes, Fisherman's Noir isn't a genre, but maybe it should be. <laughs> and Michael Cortia, I hope I'm saying his name right, uh, another New York Times bestselling author said, Peter Heller is the poet laureate of the literary filler, thriller. And then I found this on Goodreads, and this is a synopsis of the book. Jack can fish, but he just can't catch a break. <laughs> and this is where I would like you to add a warm Thank you, Dodie and Jen and Kat from the library. Thanks to the folks uh, from the book bar who are outside selling books. It's so great that they came. Um, and thank you guys for coming out. Oh my gosh. Um, this is my last um, Colorado event, and I'm going to fishing in Montana tomorrow. <laughs> Sight. Uh, it's great to be here. You guys, reading to this crowd in Denver is like reading to extended family because you all know the territory, um, and I just you know you follow probably uh, the novels, and I just you know it means a lot to a writer to have that kind of kind of support at home. And so I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, could you guys handle like a real reading, like 16 minutes of reading? Sure. It's a lot. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, please let me know. Um, and I'll try and stay on it. I have a habit of like. Not a minute over. Turning. <laughs> I don't usually read that long. Uh, so my dad, if you guys have been to any of my readings, you know that my father uh, read to me when I was little, uh, almost every night, and it was my favorite thing. And you know, it, it started when I was really small and went up all the way up, you know, until I was probably too old to be read to <laughs> by my dad at night. But I just loved it, and um, so I think it's fun to get read to. I don't think we get read to enough. Uh, the other thing is, um, it's great, I think, to hear fiction in the voice of the author because you get, I, I, I'm a very aural writer and I sort of listen for the voice and when I'm reading it, you sort of get to hear it how I heard it, which is sort of cool. Um, but I never know if reading at a reading is like going to a slideshow. <laughs> you know, we always went to our friends' slideshows and we really hated them, but we never did. Um, so, so if this gets a little long, um, do what my wife does and just start nodding off and go, too much fishing. <laughs> and I'll know to quit. <laughs> so I'm gonna start at the beginning, um, save you guys a little time, I think, guys. Um, Prologue. They gave him a bunk in a cabin by the river, a wooded canyon, spruce and pine with rim rock up high and rock spurs that tumbled to the water. Jack dropped his pack on the porch. It was a cool afternoon with high running clouds that tugged their shadows over the canyon. He looked around. The cabin was on the edge of a steep bank in the shadow of the pines and a staggered rush rose from the creek below and was carried by the sift of wind in the trees. A creek, really. They called it a river, but up this high was his favorite kind of stream, an easy toss of a stone across and shallow enough in places to wade bank to bank. He studied the rhythm of it. 
How's, how's the volume? Is it popping or anything? It's okay? Okay. He studied the rhythm of it. It slid around a left bend and broke right through a jumble of boulders and coursed into a long black pool stuttered with smooth rocks. At the top of the pool, he could see a pedestrian bridge and a fisherman's trail heading upstream on the other side. Trout water out of a dream. The shack was basic. On the narrow covered porch were a stack of split firewood and two cane rockers. He didn't really care what was inside. He thought he could sit on this deck and watch that stream for the rest of his life. The lodge was booked solid from August 20th, what the manager told him. They would close on October 30th or when the snow got too heavy, whichever came first. Jack would guide one fisher per day or a couple, no more, boutique fishing at its best, finest. $200 a day plus tips, one day off every 10 unless he wanted to skip it. Good money. Less than he could make riding a drift boat on the Colorado, but it included food, lodging, and two drinks or two beers a night. After that, Jenny cuts you off. We encourage the guys to hang out at the bar before dinner and converse with guests, but there's nothing sadder than a sodden fishy guy, am I right? That was the manager, Kurt Jensen, stepping onto the porch and handing him a card with a key code to open the heavy art gate at the head of the drive. Two giant rusted cams that rocked apart with a grinding of heavy chains and cogs that slid thick steel doors edged with leaping trout. You'll need it to get out and in. Why do you need a code to open it from the inside, Jack said. Kurt had pulled the screen, was shoving the cabin door with his shoulder. He was a big man, maybe 6'1", wearing a cowboy hat and a wool vest. He was gray at the temples and had grainy blue eyes, and Jack figured he was pushing 50. Door sticky, Kurt said. I can get you a palm sander tomorrow. Forget it, I got a flat file in the truck. Should work. If Kurt heard him, he didn't say. He was already inside, taking in the sparse log room. So it's a basic cabin, it's got a wood stove, Pendleton blanket, Jack's beside himself. <laughs> it's perfect. The cabin was pretty close quarters. Jack had a cloth face mask in his back pocket and he looped it over his ears and Kurt waved it away. You won't need that around here. It makes the guests uneasy. Fact is, everyone but you has been tested. Ginny takes everyone's temperature when they come into the bar every night. You don't strike me as a hang out in a crowd type of guy, so I'm willing to take the risk. You were saying about the gate, Jack said. I was? Yeah, why you need a code to open it? I mean, from the inside. So nothing just hits the button, like a coyote or some blowdown. The last one we had was always opening on its own and all kind of random public was coming in and they just start fishing. Walk right past all the houses and fish until we ran them off. God, sounds rough, Jack said dryly. If there was any sarcasm in Jack's tone, it didn't register with the manager. So uh, Jensen tells him that the stretch is a mile and a half. It's called, the locals call it billionaire's mile. It's private water. And, uh, and he tells him that his, his first client in the morning is Allison K. And Jack's intrigued by that. And he's like, what's with the initials? And Jensen says, well, you know, the rich and famous, they use a lot of initials. <laughs> You'll get used to it. And um, so, uh, let's see. So they go to unload Jack's truck. Jack had a topper on his truck covering the bed and Kurt reached for the latch on the back and Jack put a hand on his arm. I got this, he said, thanks. Kurt stepped back. Suit yourself, see you in a couple of hours. Did I say it's a mile and a half a river? You, Cody, the guests, that's it. Me, if I ever have time, which sad to say I don't. Mr. Dan doesn't even want the cooks or wait staff or maintenance fishing. Most pristine water on the planet, what he says. We don't even ever mention the dam or the reservoir up below the pass. Never mention it. In Mr. Den's mind and the guest's minds, this is the wildest river on earth. Got it? Now finally a spark of irony flashed in his eyes. Yep. So our stretch starts at the first big meadow up top down to the barbed wire at Ellery's. 
I think you'll have time to scout most of it before dinner. The rest, you can fake it. Jack gave him a thumbs up. When you're fishing upstream, don't go one step past the post at the start of the meadow. There's a sign on it, don't get shot. Not kidding. I think Kreutzer's got a goddamn spotting scope and I know he has a rifle. One day he's gonna kill somebody, no shit. Damn. I told you, crazy. Bad shit crazy. Kurt turned away and Jack said, oh hey. The manager half turned back. It's mid-season. What happened to the other guy, my predecessor? Kurt's eyes sparked and he pursed his lips. Predecessor? He gave Jack a once-over as if really seeing him for the first time. Compact, broad-shouldered, strung together with maybe bailing wire, whiff of the ranch. Crow's feet pumped <clears throat> the corners of Jack's eyes, earned probably in the saddle, just to guess. Tough. But he'd read on the short resume, Dartmouth College, explained the vocabulary. He'd hired college boys before, nothing against them. Ken? Ken the head? He up and quit. Said it was family trouble, but I just don't think he had the stamina. Kurt's smile was straight across. Uh, so, uh, they chat a little bit more, and then Jack, he watched Jensen go, and Jack closed his eyes. He smelled the warm pine needles on the sandy track and heard the muffled rush of the river reverberating in its bed and murmured, you're all right, new gig, couple months, knee deep in a river, what could be better? And he almost believed it. So, um, so Jack goes fishing. And so can you, can you stand another section or should we just stop there? Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> you asked for it. Um, so Jack goes fishing and it is, it's just this beautiful, I mean, you guys know the Taylor River maybe. Uh, and, and it's three years after the river and he had a rough go in that book, if you've read it. And he gets on this brown trout and it makes a run, and he fishes it really well, and he brings it in, and there's a little fisherman's pedestrian bridge, wooden bridge over the, over the river. And this isn't a spoiler, because you get this in the first few pages, but uh, he brings it, he unhooks it, he kind of holds it gently, loosely in his hands, he lets it recover. And for the first time in like a couple of years, he feels like some joy, you know, which is why he got this job. He thought he'd get connected to something that he loved. And, um, and he lets the trout go and he's feeling, you know, he's feeling good. And he looks up and there's a camera lens, fisheye lens on the bridge, right over his head. And he feels so violated. And he almost gives it the finger, but then he thinks, Probably a bad attitude for his first day on the job. <laughs> the owner's probably watching. So he fishes on, and um, so that, that kind of disturbs him. And here he is uh, heading down to dinner. Where did that go? Here we go. Jensen says that dinner's at 6.30. He encourages him to come early and chat up the, chat up the guests. He was back at the cabin at 6.05, and he rinsed in the hot shower, put on jeans and boots and a snap shirt, and coasted the teal bike down to the main lodge at 6.20. All the cabins have these like cruiser bikes because they're trying to be like Crested Butte. <laughs> um, the clouds had cleared, it would be a cold night, and they already had a fire roaring in the stone hearth. Overkill, Jack thought. It might be 60 degrees outside. To the right of the hearth was a U-shaped mahogany bar where five people sat on stools and a tall, broad-shouldered Brit with shaggy blonde hair presided behind it. Ginny the Enforcer. Two drink Ginny. He knew she was a Brit because she called Ah, oh, come on in, mate. We've been expecting you. You've barely got time. And he heard the sigh of a cat being cracked, and she set a sweating bottle on a napkin on the polished wood, cutthroat ale. Come in. Don't be shy. Everyone, this is Jack. Jack, everyone, have a seat. The conversation stopped, and 
Everyone turned on their stools. Scooch a bit closer, love, Jimmy said to Jack, and she raised a no-touch thermometer from behind the bar. Suddenly, staying at home and working the ranch with a taciturn father was looking more appealing. It was the second time in a few hours that Jack had been set back on his heels. Jenny was exuberant. She had little use for polite preliminary. She left no room for second thoughts. He got it. In this way, she was the perfect metro de hotel of a rustic getaway for the rich and famous. Once the guests got used to her provincial pub manners, they were at ease in a way that was probably refreshing. <clears throat> Jenny blew zero smoke. It didn't give a shit what was in your portfolio or how many gold records you'd made. Was the fishing good? Was it fun anyway? Did you see the bald eagle and the big aspen right over the trout pond? Did you know that he ate their precious stock trout like popcorn? That you couldn't shoot the son of a bitch because he's federally protected? I wish I were federally protected. Can you imagine? Hand over all your large bills and see you tomorrow. Ha! Huh. She was a hoot. He got it. She also seemed to know just when to dial it back. She must have noticed his discomfort as he pulled up a stool because she stuck out an elbow to bump and in a calm, confiding tone, she said, I'm Jenny, glad you're here. And she smiled a real, almost shy smile. I know my reputation precedes me, but I'm not that strict. Kirk means well. Tell me where you're coming from, love. And in that way, she slipped him into a bubble of conversation in which he did not have to meet the guests all at once. And she slid him a jar of long beef jerky twists, the real stuff made from strips of sirloin, probably, and crusted with pepper. And she said, eat as many as you like, but save your appetite. Gianno's made his famous elk loin tonight. In a few minutes, he'd acclimated enough to introduce himself to the others. Allison Kay, early 30s, who was famous, but had creases at the corners of her eyes and an air of someone in the habit of pursuing truth. She was seated next to a large man, heavy set with dark comb back hair who wore a blue sport coat and a pinky ring. He glanced at Jack, swept him up and down with dour eyes, nodded, no fist bump or name. That's, that's her security guy. Next to him was Will in a silver button vest and ostrich boots, maybe 60, clearly well heeled and his wife, Nev, 40-ish with turquoise earrings and the most luxurious black hair halfway down her back. A younger couple in their late 20s in Arcturix fleece and moccasins, who Jack bet were accomplished fisher people and had probably already thrown flies on every continent. And Cody, the other god, lean maybe six feet, three-day beard, high cheeks, and eyes set wide like a wolf's, who was too far around the bar to shake hands, but when the dinner bell did chime and they all stood and he and Cody met by the hearth and shook, his handshake and F.U. to the virus, Jack noticed his white's packer boots and felt in the iron grip and callous fingers the temper of another ranch kid. Cody's eyes when they met were not friendly or unfriendly, just watchful, fair enough. He and Cody shared a table in the far corner downstream beside a window that overlooked the river. In the long silences, they ate with a sharp hunger, and Cody raised a finger to Shay, the server, twice. And she picked up his plate and brought it back heaped with elk loin and gravy and mashed potatoes. You can do that, Jack murmured. Get second or third. Eat as much as you want. Damn. You'll get used to it the second time he'd heard the phrase that day. Jack ate and looked out the French window and watched the river fill up with shadow and watched the low sun burnish the tops of the tallest pines. Did you fish it, Cody said. Huh, sorry? Shea set down two dessert plates, panna cotta with fresh blueberries. She stepped back quickly as if she just fed two lions. Three, two, one, go, she said. No seconds. She added, but I do have tons of ice cream. Jack thought her accent was Carolina somewhere. She wore tight jeans and a light plaid shirt and had a small anchor tattoo on the inside of her wrist, maybe homemade. Cody actually smiled, first one Jack had seen. Ain't gonna bite, he said to Shay. TBD, she said, went back through the swinging door. Jack said, sorry, you were asking? Did you have time to fish before dinner? Oh yeah, I did. 
Cody slipped his spoon into the flank of the panna cotta, didn't look up. Which way? Upstream. The pool under the bridge? Yep. Get to the post? I saw the meadow turned around. Cody didn't say another word. He ate his dessert and lifted a chin at Shay, who came through the door with a silver coffee pot. Really, she said as she sailed by? Ice cream? Gee, I wouldn't have guessed. Jack? Jack shook his head. On her way back, Shay filled her coffee cups. They both drank it black. What's with the cameras? Jack said finally. Cody was studiously corralling blueberries with his spoon, tongue in the corner of his mouth like he was solving a math problem. He glanced up. Cameras? Yeah, on the bridge. Dude lives in England, Mr. Dent, most of the year. He likes to watch the trout under the bridge, the salmon when they're running. Huh, bet he likes to see who's fishing, too. Cody shrugged. He knows your face, knew it before you got here. No alarm bells there. Any other cameras, I mean, on the river? Cody gave up and tilted the blueberries on the plate into his palm and ate the whole bunch. His wolf eyes never changed. No light there, really, no passing shadows, just a flat watchfulness. Never seen any. The one who's probably got cameras is Kreutzer. I wouldn't take a half step beyond his line. He shot at me last summer, no shit. I don't know if he missed or he's just a really good shot. Damn. Dicey around here. Downstream, past the wire. Ellery doesn't shoot, he just has dogs. Dogs? Mr. Jensen didn't mention any dogs. He wouldn't. I guess he figures he'll ease you in. Make sure you don't get shot first. Tell you about mauling later. Damn, what kind of dogs? Mastiffs, hounds, like five of them, and a couple of German shepherds. They chase deer. Once in a while, they'll drag one back. Never seen anything like it. Whoa. Mauled a fisherman in June, nearly killed him. They weren't put down? Guy had a Glock in his vest. Armed intruders, how Ellery framed it, had the right to self-defense. DA went along with it, not sure why the dude didn't get the gun out fast enough. Jack knew why. Mastiffs, unlike most other dogs, will sometimes silently stalk their prey, probably leapt on the poor bastard mid-cast the way a lion would. Jesus, Jack said, fishing around here is high stakes. Cody's laugh was short, more like a cough, and joyless. Jack sipped his coffee. He noticed that Cody picked up his cup in two hands the way you would at a fire on a cold night. Hunter for sure, rancher almost certainly. Jack said, you all run cows, you and your folks? For the first time, Cody's eyes darkened. Folks passed. I'm sorry, Jack was about to say that his own mother had gone many years before, but he closed his mouth. We did run cattle, Cody said. The Flying W, Dad had a little airstrip. Where at? Hotchkiss. Jack nodded, he knew the country. He and Pop and Uncle Lloyd had hunted units in the West Elks a couple of years for a change of scenery. End of conversation, apparently. Shane brought a soda fountain glass stuffed with three scoops of chocolate ice cream and Cody dug in. Jack excused himself. Been a long day, he said. I better get sorted. He passed the ta table where Alice and Kay ate with a man in the jacket, and she looked up, smiled, and said, see you bright and early? Yes, ma'am. He touched the brim of his baseball cap and pushed out through the heavy door into the cold night. So, uh, thanks, for, thanks for bearing um, through that. <laughs> that's, a, that's the longest reading I've ever done, <laughs> ever. Uh, so, um, I, I want to tell you guys a little bit about how this book got written because all they're all so different and um, they all seem to have different methods. Um, so I always start, you know, I came up as a poet and I always am a little more interested when I begin a book in the music of the language than the story or the plot. And I, I never, I never plot at the beginning. Um, or write an outline or anything. I, um, I read John Gardner's book on how to write a novel, and, and, and he's, you know, his method was you write an outline, then you just fill it in with smaller and smaller A's, B's, C's, one, two, threes. And I, and I thought, man, if you're going to do that, I, you know, could have been a lawyer. You know, <laughs> uh, nothing wrong with it. It's just um, not my cup of tea. And and so I just start and I sort of let it rip. And I started with this first line, and there was. Um, you know, this guy dropping his back on this porch. And uh, 
I was sort of psyched because I'm a sucker for a good porch always. And I really love a good porch, <laughs> especially if it looks over water or mountains. And then there was Jack. And I was so glad to see him. Uh, you know, I was worried about him. I had been worried about him. Um, you know, if you read The River, that I left him brokenhearted and, and pretty alone. I mean, he was going back to work the ranch with his father. Um, but his father is taciturn and, and pretty self-contained. And so, so I was concerned for Jack. And, and there he was apparently getting a job as a fly fishing guy. And I thought, that's good. That'll be good for you. <laughs> Little did I know what was going to ensue. And then, uh, so I had that start. And then I was thinking, then I thought about something an author had told me a few years before. And I was at a book festival outside of Palm Springs, and it was kind of this um, super sort of fancy golf resort around a golf course. It's a strange place, place to have a book festival, but there it was. It was like three days. And, and when I go to those, um, to make them sort of, uh, to ground myself, because they can be kind of frenetic, uh, I usually get up really early and I get a cup of coffee if I can find it, and I work for a couple of hours. Uh, and it, you know, it's sort of a haven. And, so I went down to where they serve breakfast to this little building, and I went in and got a cup of coffee. The only other author there was Lee Child. And I, um, we sat and had breakfast, and we started talking about method. And he's, I said, uh, yeah, you know, I just start with a, a first line, and I don't have a clue, and I just, just let it rip. And he said, yeah, I do too. Kind of like, nah. <laughs> I read those Jack Reacher novels, you know, and seemed super tightly plotted, and you know, lots of subplots. And he said, "No, man, I do. I, 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 I just throw everything up against the wall that I can think of that's fun um, in the first half. Dead bodies, lurking, menacing figures, car accidents. You know, I just throw it all against the wall. In the second half, I just mirror all of that." And I tie up all the loose threads, and whatever doesn't tie up is a red herring, and, and I'm good. <laughs> and I know, right? I laughed out loud too, literally. I just burst out laughing. I said, I said, look, I read all those books about writing. I read John Carter's book. I read Stephen King's book on writing novels. And you just gave me a method, two lines, and uh, it's awesome. So I thought of that, and I thought, hey, let's just, here's Jack, let's just try it. And um, so I put the camera lens on the bridge, and I had the post with the don't get shot. I put the dog, and I had no clue. Uh, and what, I, what fascinated me about this method, really, uh, more than even how fun it was, was that if an author's gonna do that and, and pile up events and details, which at the time must seem random, and then it somehow is gonna generate a propulsive narrative and somehow all work out in the end, that suggests to me that there's a lot of work going on when we're asleep and in the unconscious. And I just think that's so cool, you know, that it, that it might all work out. So I did it, I, you know, just had faith that, and it, and it did. And I, you know, I didn't even know it was about COVID until a good way through the book. I mean, that COVID was an element. Uh, so I put, I went back and put him with a mask and then put the thermometer in the very beginning. Um, but it was it was a super fun way to write a book, and it became you know it was a thrill. I didn't know it was going to be a thriller, uh, and so that was sort of a gas. Um, yeah, so um, I think the funnest part is if let, I'm going to open it up to questions. I might, um, if you're bad, I'll read you one more paragraph <laughs> at the end. Yeah, I'll read you the whole book. We'll be here for nine hours. But uh, but don't be shy. I mean, ask anything because it's the it's the best part. You know, it always yes. Your books can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Your books kind of uh, your setting is so important, and um, it kind of reminds me of like Jane Harper and how she writes in Australia. Do you feel a responsibility like that? Like, what are you going to expose next? Like the Great Sand Dunes or something? You know. I, you mean you mean what might? Well, your uh, your settings are so important. Oh, you mean letting the public know about them? Like, well, yeah, I just kind of because you there are, are unknown parts of Colorado. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. You exposed to ever. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's gonna go to Kremlin, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, no, that's a good, I mean, you gotta be careful. So I, I um, have a favorite fishing creek outside of Paonia, and it's in several of my books. Uh, the Painter, you know, it's the featured, you know, sort of scene of the crime. And, um, and I, I disguised that really well. I mean, there's no way, if you took my book and tried to find that creek, you'd end up in Montrose. Uh, and, you know, you could do some good shopping. <laughs> So uh, the places that I love that are sort of you know un unknown, uh, I really don't don't give directions. <laughs> and I change the name, but that brings up a point about people because uh, a lot of my characters um, are real, you know, based very closely on real people, and um, a lot of times, you know, like in the painter, Bobby Reedy is my very dear friend at Peony, he runs the Sinclair station. And in The Painter, his name is Bob Reed, who runs the Sinclair station. And I wrote him exactly as he is, you know, described him how he is and how he talks and everything. And it was interesting, because I gave the book, I'll just, this is totally, uh, you know, this is a side story, but I gave him the book when it came first came out on a Friday night and I was driving back in on Sunday morning into town, and uh, my place was south of town, like three miles, just like Jim Steger's place. In. And I passed his son's trailer, and, and Bobby was coming out of the driveway in his truck, and we pulled up truck to truck, and he said, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I was like, oh, crap, what do I do now? And uh, he said, I started that damn book at eight last night. And I didn't finish till 11 this morning. I didn't get a wink of sleep. I loved it. And then he told me that there's one line in there where uh, he comes out of the station and, and you know, Jim Stegner has killed this guy with a rock. And Bobby's Bob says, you know, Jim, you just can't go around killing people, just saying. And uh, Bobby said to me, he said, you know, I, I would have never said that. <laughs> Yeah. Is Allison K. Allison Krauss? No way. <laughs> Not a chance. Not a chance. Is, are, is the lawyer here? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know anything about Allison Krauss, but I love her music. And, you know, remember um, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? You know, I mean, gosh, I mean, she is just amazing. And, and I love her. And uh, so. Uh, maybe Alice K is sort of how I imagined someone like Alison Krauss might be, but that's as close as I can tell you. <laughs> She's a great sidekick to Jack. Yeah, they're great. I mean, when I first, when, so they meet, at, you know, briefly that I just read, but the next morning they get, you know, he goes down early for his cup of coffee and she's, the, the, she's there and they have their first conversation. And uh, it was so fun to write because, you know, Jack understood right away that she has a very, very dry, wry sense of humor, and, and, he, and he does too, and they, were, they really appreciate each other, and it, and it was just so fun to write, and I was like, okay, I think these guys are gonna be buddies. And, uh, so anyway, won't give anything away. Another question? Still another hand go up. Yeah. As a uh, fisherman and environmentalist, you're quite aware that a number of cross streams in both Colorado and Montana were closed because of high temperatures. Yeah. What's your reaction to that? That may become the new norm. So, you know, it's not, I mean, this is nothing new. I mean, I was out uh, two summers ago. I was fishing my favorite creek in, um, it was late August, outside of Paonia. And I fished for probably almost a good hour. And I caught a couple of fish. And then I thought, something's wrong. Because I was, I was wet wading, you know, I just had shoes on and shorts. And I thought, you know, my, my feet and legs aren't numb. And I took the thermometer out of my bag, which I hadn't thought to do, and, I, and the creek was 70 degrees. And this is a Mount Creek in a, in a, in a spruce fir canyon, you know, up pretty high. And um, I felt so bad for those fish. I mean, you should never catch fish above like 64, uh, because 
uh, warmer water contains less oxygen, so they have a really hard time recovering. And um, you know, I just waited out, sat down on a rock, and I basically friggin' cried. You know, I was like, it shouldn't be like this. Late August, and it's this time of year, the nights are supposed to be getting cold, and uh, where you know where I was, and uh, so I'm going to Montana tomorrow to go fishing um, with some friends, and um, and. There was hoot owl warnings, you know, all the way up until a few days, I guess a week ago, uh, where they kick everybody off in two because it gets too warm. And it's, it's calm. I mean, it's here, man. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just so sad, yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I, I, I just add a, add to that. Um, so I went fishing, and it's great to tell you guys the story because you know, you, know, you know the places. But um, so I went fishing March twenty fourth, the night they closed lockdown Denver. And remember how everyone? I mean, I, can you guys like recall what that was like when there? Were, it was way more unknown than known, and everybody, you know, there was that fear of just not knowing what this was and what was coming. And they, you know, they locked down Denver, and I, I went to Chatfield, and I like to fish sometimes that stretch below Waterton Canyon that, that run through the big cottonwoods and Chatfields. You can pretend you're sort of out there, you know, but it's only half an hour from my house. And um, I remember that evening, I went through the gate, and there was no ranger. There's always a ranger. I mean, this is you know a couple hours before sunset, and there were no cars in the big parking lot by the big lake. And I went around it. And I went to the gravel ponds. I parked at the little gravel lot where the fishermen park, and there was two trucks. So I walked through the cottonwoods, and I saw two guys fishing, and they waved, but it was kind of wary, you know. And one guy said, "Hey, man, it's just all suckers." and I started fishing and the suckers were running and that's what was there. And I caught, I did catch one trout, but, but I swear I started to feel like Hig because in the dog stars, you know, he's fishing for suckers and carp and pretending that there's trout because they, you know, all the trout are gone because it's too warm. And, and, you know, it's this feeling of like, you know, no, nobody was there and the ranger wasn't there and I was, the night got cool and I was fishing and, I, I got sort of goosebumps, and then I drove up Wadsworth, and all the businesses were closed, and, the, and it was pretty empty, and I just, you know, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I was like, you know, is life imitating art? Am I, is the, am I like Hig, you know? It's like, it was, it was pretty weird. So uh, anyway, and then I wrote The River, and that's about big fires up in Canada, right? And that was two years before. So my wife's like, you know, and this book, you know, posits a, uh, a time when there's variants, and I wrote it when there was one COVID. I wrote it in the middle of COVID when there was just one. So now my wife's like, you, be, you better be careful what you write about. Right? <laughs> you <know? laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Someone had raised a, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's really interesting because when I read the intros, I mean, I love the story, but the writing was amazing. So um, it was just so descriptive, and I found it. I thank you. I found it really lovely to read. Oh, thanks. And so your use of words that kind of makes sense. Could you talk a little bit about how you know your life as a poet? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I, I so I. My dad was reading poetry to me when I was like, he comes to me when I was like six, you know? And I still remember, you know, Buffalo Bill's defunct, who used to ride a silver, water-smooth stallion and break one, two, three, four, five pigeons just like that. Jesus, he was a handsome man. And what I want to know is, 
how do you like your blue-eyed boy, Mr. Death? And, you know, I'm like blinking up at my dad at six. It's like, you know, thank goodness I didn't understand the poems, but because a lot of them, a lot of them were pretty bawdy, um, but, uh, but I love the sound of the language. I was like, I want to do that. Even when I was like six, I was like, I want to do that. And then, you know, I, he, he was reading Yeats to me when I was like 11, you know, prayer for my daughter. You know, I walked and prayed for this young child an hour, heard the sea wind scream upon the tower and under the arches of the bridge and scream in the elms above the flooded stream. I mean, how could I not like fall in love with it? You know the language. I just loved it, and so I wanted to be a poet. And and then, um, have you guys heard this, the library story with the librarian? Uh, I, I don't want to repeat myself. Um, my dad quit drinking because he had repeated himself at a party. He was so vain. <laughs> uh, good reason to quit, I guess. Uh, uh, but anyway. Um, when I was 11, I, I grew up in New York City and I, in Brooklyn Heights, and I was in my little school and um, in the little library. And this is a great, this is a great story to tell in a library because uh, libraries are so awesome and librarians are too. And uh, I was wandering around and I had a crush on the librarian. Her name was Annie Bosworth and she was English and I would have married her that day. Uh, just for how she said my name, she said, Pete are you looking for something to read? And I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, she followed my reading since I was five. And so she knew like a great librarian or a great bookseller who's followed your reading and knows you, you know, they sort of know what you're ready for. And she, she went to the fiction shelf and she pulled off In Our Time by Ernest Hemingway, the slim little volume of short stories. Most of them are up in Michigan, Nick Adams stories. And you got a picture of an 11 year old kid um, taking that home and you know, in Brooklyn and cracking it open. I mean, my, my heart left out of my chest. I mean, I was like, I want to do that. I want to hop off a, a slow moving freight train with a rucksack and walk through grass that wets my pants with dew and make camp by the big two hearted river and make cowboy coffee. I didn't know what that was, but it sounded awesome. And, um, and not burn my tongue the way Nick didn't burn his tongue and then, you know, fish for those gorgeous trout. and. Uh, the end of something, that beautiful breakup story, is like, I, wa I wanted so bad to have a girlfriend that could row and fish like a man. I hadn't asked Andy Bosworth if she could do that. <laughs> uh, and then break up with her, because Nick did, right? You know, I, was, I, I never understood why he did that. Um, but mainly what I wanted to do was, it was the first time that I'd experienced like prose that went like through my skin and straight to my heart, you know, kind of bypassed the head. And I don't know if you guys have ever had that experience with some some writing, you know, and it just it just blew me away. And I was like, you know, Hemingway's a he's a trouble, you know, is a, right now he's you know he's a trouble figure <laughs> to grapple with. But the writing was just 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 bowled me over, and I wanted to do that, you know. So I wanted to do both poetry and fiction when I was coming up, and I did everything I could, you know. I, I read poetry like crazy, and. Um, I did stuff, I heard Jack Lemnon would put words up on the wall that he didn't know, and I did that on cards, you know. Uh, I copied poems and, like I copied paragraphs from Eudora Welty's short stories and Faulkner, you know, that I just loved, and just to feel what it was like. And um, I was serious about it, you know, and I went to college, and I, I took a lot of biology, uh, almost a whole bio major, because I thought, you know, I'm gonna be writing about nature, because that's where I'd love to be. And, I better know the difference between a spruce and a pine, you know, and, and so, uh, and I studied English, and then I got out of college, and, and, you know, I had to make a living, and it's tough to make a living as a poet, uh, so um, I started writing for magazines, because I, I was a kayaker, and it was an easy way into out, outdoor magazines, but, um, but the whole time, you know, I was just, I mean, I had a wonderful career doing that, but when I came to sit down to write the novel that I'd always wanted to write, you know, um, in 2010 or whatever that was, 2011, um, The Dog Stars, um, I had been writing for Business Week and they were paying really well and uh, I thought I had nine months I could probably, you know, write without taking, taking an assignment. And, and I sat down and it was like, it was like the most marvelous thing because it was like I was coming home you know, it was like, I can write anything I freaking want now. I'm not responsible to the people in this article. 
to you know to because you you got you got to be you know you got to be really careful and get it right you know when you're writing about real people committed people who are in their lives so um, and and I thought and you know it was like I can write lyrically if I want as lyrically as I want to you know I don't have to write something that's going to take a pie graph uh, you know so I was it was really awesome it was like coming home yeah so. Oh, we're doing good. Yeah. This morning, I think Brian Warner chose your book for his reading circle. Oh, and awesome! I think they have the the broadcasting of that at the end of the month. Is that something that you think you participate in, or I don't? Yeah, know. yeah. I mean, I, I had seen it on the schedule that there was something with uh, CPR, but I, I wasn't sure what it what it was. That's really cool. Brian Warren, so Warner, so far we did a we did a thing together on the stage at uh, at Grand Junction at their, their Avalon Theater. It was such a hoot. He always loves to. Um, he's a, like a trickster, Brian Warner. I don't know if you know that, but he's like a coyote, and uh, <laughs> he loves to pull sort of pranks or you know surprises. We were reading at the Tatter. I was in conversation with him for the painter at the Tatter Cover, and it was a packed house. And he said, I have a surprise for you. And there was a painting on an easel under a canvas. And he pulled off the canvas very dramatically, and there was Winslow Homer's uh, Fog Warning, which features in the book. It's the reason that my character, Jim Stegner, becomes a painter, because he sees that when he's 17 in a museum. And he said, do you want to talk about that? So that was really fun. And when we were at the Avalon Theater, I had, um, I had dedicated the book to my dad, and I said something like, uh, the best story I tell her I ever heard, to my father, the best story teller I ever heard, who's, who sang to me, Little Joe the Wrangler and Barbara Allen. Such beautiful songs. And so we're up on this stage, and Ryan Warner says, I got a surprise for you. I'm looking around, I don't know, you know, what's gonna drop, you know? Or, and, uh, and he had this guy come out, uh, this music, and he played Little Joe the Wrangler. It was just, it was just so new. Yeah, it was really great. I mean, God, he had he got me all choked up <laughs> right in time for the interview. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, we can take like two more. I have a question. For yeah. You. So the librarians and the booksellers, and maybe some of you, are discussing whether this is a sequel. Is it a standalone? Are we gonna go back and hear about young Jack? Are we gonna flash forward into the future and hear more about Jack? Are you ready to let Jack go? So uh, yeah, tough question. I mean, I mean, so when you write, you start with the first line and you're just listening for the music of the language. I mean, you don't, really don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not being flip, you know, when I say just let it, let it rip and don't have a clue. When I wrote the, when I sat down and wrote the Dog Stars, my first novel, I thought, okay, I didn't know what was legal. You know, like, could you sit down? Was it legal to sit down and just start and not have a even a loosely blocked idea? Would the fiction police like bust down your door? You know, and say, hey. Uh, but I thought, you know, I've been writing nonfiction for 30 years. You know, all these magazine stories and these nonfiction books. I always know what's going to happen next, and I always know what the ending's going to be. And it's like I just don't want to know. I mean, I was a kayaker. One great thing about running rivers, if you've never run a river and you don't know about it, or nobody has, then you come around a bend, you don't know what's going to be there. It's like so cool. I mean, it's a little different than climbing because climbing usually you can see what's there, but in a river, you know, it could be a cougar drinking around the corner, or a flight of swallows, or you know, whatever, a waterfall. And I love that thrill about it, and I wanted the writing to feel like that. I wanted to have as much fun as you guys. So I just sat down and I started, okay, you know. Um, and I'll get, I'll get around to your question in a second, but I'm not brushing it off. I want to, but I'm not. Uh, uh, so uh, anyway, I sat down, I was like, uh, you know, I keep the beast running, I keep the low lead on tap. Okay, low lead is aviation fuel, so I know there's a plane around. Uh, I'm young enough, I'm old enough, I foresee attacks, and then a few lines later, my name is Hig, one name. Big Hig, if you need another. If I ever woke up crying in the middle of a dream, and I'm not saying I did, it's because the trout are gone, every one. I just like, I was like, okay, I'm listening, you know, speak. And he did, you know, I would go into the coffee shop, 
And I would tell myself, don't think, don't think, just listen. And then he would start talking, and it was like he was on the other side of a campfire on an October night with the wind blowing the flames around, telling me what had happened to him a few years before. And it was like the most thrilling thing I'd ever experienced. And I got like a couple of pages into it, and it was clear that it was a post-apocalyptic novel. And I was like, oh crap, I don't want to write a post-apocalyptic novel. I mean, this is my first chance to debut novel, you know, I want to write literary fiction, not genre. But his voice was so compelling, you know. And then the other thing I thought was, well, if it gets published at all, it's going to get compared to The Road and Cora McCarthy. You just don't, you do not want to get compared to The Road, you know, like when you're a debut novelist, bad idea, right? But, but it was so compelling, you know. I just, I just, I had, I, I, I kept going, and stuff would happen, and I would just, I would just like have tears like dripping onto the coffee top table. And I know people in the coffee shop, my, my local, were, were like looking at me going, that poor son of a bitch. You know, he's, he's going through a bad divorce. Or, you know, it's like his dog died or something. But really what was happening was I was the most thrilled I'd ever been, you know, and I love that. And so what, what I've realized using that method now for six, seven novels, Kanab, I just finished one in Kanab, just took it, I'm so pleased. Um, it's about an enforcement ranger in Yellowstone who loves wolves more than people and gets them in trouble. But anyway, uh, when you use this method, you know I've, I've come to understand through writing now half a dozen novels is that you know you start out with the music of the language and you ride the language into the story, and eventually, usually within like two pages, you're going to bump into what's really on your heart, what you're really concerned about, uh, and then you write that. You know, with Celine. Um, it was a young woman who thought her, the death of her father, purported death of her father by a bear attack that never found the body was a little bit fishy and she, she hired a private investigator to, to look into it. Well, the PI that she hired was my mom and she had died a year before and I missed her so terribly. And what I realized, you know, four pages into the book, starting with this young woman story, which I thought it was gonna be about, what I really wanted to write about was my mom, because I missed her, you know? So, uh, so it's an interesting way to go. So back to your question. <laughs> the short answer uh, was that, um, you know, if, if Jack starts talking again, if he shows up, yeah, of course. I mean, I love Jack. I mean, Jack, I feel very close to him. I mean, he, he approaches the world a lot the way I do. I mean, people would ask, like, are you Hig? And I would always say, no, nah, you know, Hig is 6'2 and can cook, you know, so it's not me, you know, clearly. But, uh, but Jack, I feel super close to. So I, I mean, I would love it if he appeared again. I don't know if this is a sequel or not. I don't think you need to read The River to, uh, to, to love the guy. So, so that's it. I'll take one more, yep. Now, have you started a book in this way and then partway through or like, like, nope, it's not going anywhere? Yeah, like the dog. So the dog. Okay, what I didn't tell you about the dog stars was I spent, um, I don't know, five weeks or something writing. I wrote twenty thousand words of another novel that I threw out. Uh, it was about a young, a seventeen-year-old girl who could fly from her point of view, you know, first person. And I got, you know, twenty thousand. That's like a fifth of the novel into it. And I was starting to feel like it didn't have this knock of like true, you know, that hard hardwood knock you know, feel to it. So I went to, uh, Helen Thorpe is one of my um, first readers, and I, and I was in her kitchen, I said, you know, I, I said, can I read to you? So I read like 45 minutes, and I stopped. This is my first novel, right? And I stopped and I said, it's not, I don't think this is working. And she said, it's so great you're writing fiction, you know? Uh, it's really great, um, and 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 I knew then that it, it wasn't going to work, and um, so yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the problem with that method is you know you do make I, I probably make you know seven false starts you know on average and crumple them up and throw them out um, until I get on a voice and I think I want to spend months with this character you know at this point. So, um, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna read. You guys have been um, pretty good. <laughs> So I'm gonna read, read um, one last paragraph or page. That night he dreamt of wind. They were fishing a creek together. 
a creek out of some myth that ran in a braid of silver between two countries. One burned to black, black earth blown with swirls of ash, black stumps charred to daggers and still smoking. And then the other side, green woods, lush with late summer, and along the banks, tall grass and pink fireweed, the swaying limbs of spruce and bird song. The stream ran like a shining cord between them, and they were fishing it together. They fished it the way they always did, he wading higher into virgin water, casting up into the bends, and wind coming a ways behind, taking his time, pool to pool, managing to catch just as many trout, though Jack had already fished through, too far apart to talk, but close enough to hail. In the dream, the burned country was on his right, and he pushed upstream, and the current was cold and alive against his unwaded legs, the wind cooling the backs of his ears, and he turned once and saw wind casting across, the tall length of him, leaning a little, the very trees behind and above him, the way he moved, the back cast with the sure rhythm of a metronome, but easy too, the line whispering out straight, and Jack, knew in the next moment when would be on a fish. And in the dream, he turned away with a kind of tact to give his friend the privacy of the catch without audience. And he waded up into his own riffle and continued to cast. He dropped the dry fly at the edge of the far bank to mimic a bug falling out of the grass and saw a huge fish break water. And even before he felt the sharp pull of the line, he turned for a split second to celebrate with wind and wind was gone. An upstream wind blew a gust of ash across the pool and there was no wind in the drifting plume. Jack's rod was jumping and the reel was unspooling, but he dropped it and ran straight into the bitter grit of the cloud. But even as he did, he knew he would never see his chosen brother again. He knew he would stand in the icy current and the ash would dust the black water and he would call and call, and there would never be an answer. In all that divided country, he would be alone. He woke sometime in the middle of the night and his pillow was wet, and he did not have to remind himself that the scene was not at all a myth, that the very stream existed far to the north, and that it was probably running this very night between acrid char and rustling woods, and that wind spirit might be there too hovering where three years before Jack had tried to stanch his bleeding. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>